Thank you, Nicole. Thank you to the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society and the Morris Jamel Mansion for inviting me to speak today. Such an honor to be speaking at the site of the first cabinet meeting, which included the great Washington, Adams, Hamilton, even Jefferson, and Knox, and others. Um, another first important in American history might have happened here, but we'll get to that in due time. I propose to you this evening that Alexander Hamilton had a more diverse contribution than anyone else during the American Revolution. So I don't mean that his contributions were more important than, say, George Washington. What I mean is the diversity of Hamilton's contributions exceeded anyone else's. So let's just go through a list of the areas in which Hamilton contributed to the war effort. Starting before the fighting actually began, in late 1774, Samuel Seabury started writing a series of essays criticizing the U.S. Congress and supporting Britain. Hamilton replied in December 1774 with a full vindication of the measures of the Congress. Hamilton at this time was still in college. He followed it up in February 1775 with the farmer refuted. In 113 pamphlet pages and over 45,000 words, Hamilton discussed natural rights, constitution, law, government, politics, military strategy, finance, economics, and foreign policy. He advocated a Fabian military strategy, supported industrialization, and predicted foreign support for the American Revolution. Hamilton's essays were sold and read throughout the colonies. Copies of a full vindication were advertised in the Philadelphia newspaper. Over in Boston, a bookseller advertised copies of The Farmer Refuted. The bookseller was none other than Henry Knox, later a commander of the artillery, major general, and secretary of war. One person writing to a Philadelphia newspaper quoted Hamilton's essay in opposition to slavery. The fact that a number of essayists replied to Samuel Seabury's essay, but Seabury only chose to reply to Hamilton's, shows that Hamilton's was very popular and needed to be responded to. Marinus Willette later remarked that Hamilton, after these great writings, became our oracle. So Hamilton followed it up with a two-part essay, Remarks on the Quebec Bill, in which he defended religious freedom. Now, numerous sources say Hamilton wrote other essays. Hamilton himself remarked that he had thrown out a handbill or two to give the necessary alarm. So what these essays are remains a mystery, but of the major essay writers, only Hamilton won distinction on the field of battle. So along with his essay writing, Hamilton was also a public speaker. Hamilton's most famous public speech, reportedly, during the run-up to the American Revolution, was his famous speech in the fields of July 1774. Supposedly, during this public meeting, Hamilton was encouraged by the crowd to go up and say what he wanted. After faltering early, he gathered strength and he amazed the people, especially given how young he was. However, there's no first-hand accounts, no first-hand accounts of this. No friends ever wrote or spoke about it. Hamilton later suggested that he was not active yet at this time. And if he gave such a speech, there's no record of what he said. But later in 1780, at a trial of a alleged traitor, Hamilton testified that he had been involved in, or at least attended, political meetings in March 1775. So it's clear that he was an active Whig after he wrote his full vindication and former refuted essays. One assumes, knowing Hamilton as we do, that he voiced his opinion at these meetings. Hamilton's son reported that Hamilton spoke to a meeting of merchants about the non-importation agreement. Having worked for a mercantile company down in St. Croix, it only makes sense for Hamilton to have addressed his fellow merchants and to bring them to the Patriot cause. Despite Hamilton's patriotic activities, he was also a defender of loyalists. Before, during, and after the war, Hamilton defended loyalists. From the preface of The Farmer Refuted, he does not presume to think every man who differs from him either fool or knave. He is sensible there are men of parts and virtue whose notions are entirely contrary to his. To imagine that there are not wise and good men on both sides must be the effect of a weak head or a corrupt heart. So thus Hamilton was arguing that not everyone who disagreed with him was either evil or stupid. And I wish we had more of this courteousness in political debates today. In May 1775, the Liberty Boys got up a mob at night to seize and publish Dr. Miles Cooper. Now, Miles Cooper was the head of King's College, where Hamilton was at college. So 
So the quote from Troop, from Hamilton's friend, Hamilton proceeded with great animation and eloquence to harangue the mob on the excessive impropriety of their conduct and the disgrace it would bring on the cause of liberty. So while Hamilton was haranguing the mob, another student helped Cooper escape from the college without being touched. Hamilton also reportedly helped protect a Ralph Thurman from a mob and also James Rivington. Now there's no evidence for either of these, but Hamilton criticized the Rivington mob in a letter to John Jay. As Washington's aide, Hamilton argued that only the most guilty loyalists should be punished and that passive loyalists who did not actively oppose the patriotic cause should just be left alone. After the war, Hamilton famously defended loyalists against confiscation of their property in his Fokion essays and as a lawyer, most notably in Rutgers v. Waddington. So how many other founding fathers can you name who literally put their life and reputation on the line to do what they thought was right and defend loyalists from the mob? So immediately after the battles of Lexington and Concord, Hamilton joined the militia company, the Corsicans. Hamilton started at the very bottom. He was a private. Within a few weeks, Hamilton was recommended for promotion. The Corsicans, or at least the members of the Corsicans, became the more famous Hearts of Oak. In August 1775, under fire from British ships, Hamilton helped rescue 21 cannons from the Grand Battery. In March 1776, Hamilton was appointed captain of a new artillery company. He had to recruit his own men. He used the last of his college money to equip his men. While well, some of the men deserted and he lost 65 pounds by the desertion from the company. Now many people remarked about the discipline and zeal of the company, especially of its captain Hamilton. This company was stationed at the Grand Battery in Fort George, which is at today's Alexander Hamilton Custom House. And then they were transferred to Bayards Hill or Fort Bunker Hill in present day Chinatown, Little Italy. In July, 1776, Two British ships, the Phoenix and the Rose, sailed up the Hudson River. Afterwards, George Washington complained that many companies simply watch the ships sail upstream and they did nothing. While well, Hamilton's was one company that decided to fire at the ships. Unfortunately, either through a defect in the cannon or mismanagement by the soldiers, one of the cannon exploded, killing and wounding a number of soldiers. When the British invaded Manhattan in September 1776, Hamilton and his company were among the last to retreat. They were rescued by none other than Aaron Burr. So retreating from New York, they come to Harlem Heights, where according to General Egbert Benson, as reported by Hamilton's son, John C. Hamilton, and I quote from John C. Hamilton's book, the next position taken was the Heights of Harlem, at which place, says Benson, Hamilton first attracted the observant eye of Washington, who on the inspection of the works which he was engaged in throwing up, entered into conversation with him, invited him to his marquee, and formed a high estimate of his military capacity. Now Washington's quarters, headquarters during this time was here at the Morris Jamel Mansion. Now this account was further embellished by fiction writer Gertrude Atherton, who wrote that Hamilton and Washington met regularly here in the house during their time at Harlem Heights, in which she imagined what she imagined to be the I quote, the happiest period of their intercourse. Now I should note that this is one of several reported first meetings between Washington and Hamilton. We don't know whether Washington, Hamilton joined Washington here in the house back in 1776, but it's likely that they did meet each other often out here in, in the Harlemites area um, since, Ham, uh, since Washington frequently inspected the army. So from Harlem Heights, they retreated with, Hamilton retreated with Washington up the Hudson River, across it, then through New Jersey. At the Raritan River at New Brunswick, Hamilton's artillery company held off the British so the rest of the army could escape. Hamilton and his company probably crossed the icy Delaware and fought in Trenton. We have an account that Hamilton definitely fought at Aslanpink Creek, which is also known as the Second Battle of Trenton. And from there, after the Battle of Assumption Creek, the soldiers marched to Princeton, where so Hamilton was almost definitely at the Battle of Princeton. But the story about Hamilton firing a cannonball through the window of Nassau Hall and beheading the head of the portrait of uh, John of King George III 
That's probably not true. All this and more brought Hamilton to the attention of Washington. Hamilton became an aide in March 1777. His primary job was not very prestigious, was to write letters. Washington had been complaining for quite a while about his inability to keep up with his correspondence. Well, this complaining stopped right when Hamilton became an aide. Hamilton wrote most of Washington's important and lengthiest letters and reports during his service. Hamilton's writing style was better than Washington's and was as good or better than the other aides. Hamilton also had more military experience than most states, giving him an edge when writing on these topics. His financial and administrative experience working as a clerk and merchant down on St. Croix also helped when he was writing about military organization and financial matters. So when Hamilton was an aide, became an aide, New York's government asked him, as if he wasn't busy enough, they asked him to report any occurrence in the army which may have happened. So over the next six months, Hamilton wrote no fewer than 25 letters to the New York Committee of Correspondence and prominent New York politicians like Governor Morris and Robert Livingston. Now, most of these letters were about military matters, but Hamilton also shared his thoughts on the new New York Constitution. Hamilton also wrote to the governor of New Jersey, who Hamilton had lived with back in prep school, and he wrote to other leading officials. Hamilton used his connections to support Washington and the Fabian strategy that Washington was employing which Hamilton had recommended way back in the Farmer Refuted in 1775. Hamilton also advocated for government support of the army, which included actually paying the soldiers, you know, giving them food, clothing, and actually they needed more men. Hamilton supported Washington against the Conway cabal and the continuing pressure to replace Washington with Horatio Gates. Hamilton also supported Washington in the feud with Charles Lee Hamilton, in a letter to Elias Boudinot, even called Lee a driveler in the business of soldiership or something much worse, which suggests that he thought Lee may have been a traitor. Elias Boudinot agreed with this, having seen indications of it previously. Hamilton often advised Congressman Elias Boudinot. Later, he became the president of Congress. Elias Boudinot, not Hamilton. Um, regarding military and political matters. In 1780, to give one example, Hamilton suggested to members of Congress to appoint Nathaniel Green, commander of the Southern Army. Hamilton expressed his confidence and high expectations after Green got appointed. Green, of course, had great success in the South and paved the way for the American victory at Yorktown and the entire American Revolution. Hamilton later called Green an accomplished master in the science of military command, the first soldier of the Revolution, and the leader of army and the, the leader of armies and the deliverer of states. So generally speaking, Hamilton was also an, a military advisor to Washington. He attended war councils, and he wasn't just there as a record keeper. He prepared summaries of the military situation for the council's consideration. He recorded the proceedings and wrote summaries of the council's discussion and determinations. He then drafted general orders and wrote instructions to individual officers. So to give some specific examples of Hamilton offering advice to Washington, at the Battle of Germantown, Hamilton and others advised going around a British troop holed up in a house. Unfortunately, some others, including Henry Knox, argued, as it was written in the books, that you don't leave a fortified castle in your rear. So they stayed, precious time was lost, and an almost certain victory was lost. Prior to the Battle of Monmouth, Hamilton and others argued against the decision of the Council of War, arguing that the Continental Army should force an engagement. Washington was convinced. So during the battle, Hamilton, knowing more about the positions of the two armies, advised Washington how to deploy the troops. Washington followed Hamilton's advice, and there was a good outcome. The Americans did very well in that battle. Some debate over whether they won or was a tie. Speaking more broadly, James McHenry noted that Hamilton's advice in many instances, a fact known to myself, had aided our chief in giving to the machine that perfection to which it had arrived previously at the close of the Revolutionary War. Similarly, Major General Marquis de Lafayette noted that Hamilton has the entire confidence of the general. And Washington himself later said that Hamilton was his principal and most confidential aide of the commander in chief. So Hamilton was at a time actually acting commander in chief. In one instance, 
Washington sent Hamilton from Pennsylvania to New Windsor, Fishkill, and Albany, New York, about 250 miles, to order Israel Putnam and Horatio Gates to move troops southward. But Washington left it up to Hamilton as a, about whether to do so, which depended on the actual situation at the time, and how many troops should be sent. By granting Hamilton discretion in his mission, Washington left the entire course of the campaign and possibly the outcome of the war in the hands of his aide. It would be up to Hamilton to decide whether thousands of troops should stay in the north or be transferred southward, thus determining whether the next phase of the war should be fought against Henry Clinton in New York or against William Howe in Philadelphia. This type of decision could only be made by the commander in chief, but the commander in chief gave that power to Hamilton. Hamilton actually sent Washington more troops than he wanted, but they were too late due to delays caused by Gates and Putnam. After Benedict Arnold's treason, Hamilton chased after him, but was too late. So he immediately wrote to Nathaniel Green to advise him to send the brigade to West Point and to prepare the rest of his army to march. Afterwards, when Hamilton returned to headquarters, Washington requested that Green do as Hamilton advised. But Green had already done so in consequence of the letter received from Colonel Hamilton. So although Hamilton advised Green, you'll notice that Washington requested that Green do something. They basically were giving Green orders, but he had discretion if he knew something that Washington and Hamilton did not. So in addition to being acting commander in chief, Hamilton was also a field commander. So at Monmouth, Hamilton advised, as Hamilton said, or ordered, according to the person he advised, one colonel to march and support the artillery. So after that, Hamilton then pressed a retreating brigade to reform and engage the enemy. Hamilton stayed with that brigade on the field of battle. Hamilton later explained that his, and I quote, horse received a wound which occasioned me a fall by which I was considerably hurt. This and previous fatigue obliged me to retire. So Hamilton also acted as a scout at Brandywine. Hamilton reportedly reconnoitered the enemy and had informed the general that they, the enemy, were in full march up the river on the other side of it towards his right. Contrary intelligence came in from others and Hamilton's report went unheeded. Un unfortunately, Hamilton was correct if the secondhand account was true. I mean, the troops were coming up the river. We just don't know if, you know, secondhand account, we're not positive Hamilton did this. Washington reported later that, unfortunately, the intelligence was uncertain and contradictory. As a result, the Battle of Brandywine was lost. Prior to the Battle of Monmouth, Hamilton spent four days and some nights reconnoitering, gathering intelligence, reporting back to Lafayette and Washington, and facilitating communication between the scattered army regiments. So Hamilton was also an acting quartermaster. So one time, Hamilton was sent with a small party to destroy some flour mills. The British arrived. Hamilton and his men jumped in the ships they had left there to escape across the river. The British fired at them. One man was killed, one was wounded, and Hamilton's horse was disabled. On the scene, riding up, was Henry Lighthorse Harry Lee. Well, he wrote to Washington that Hamilton may have been killed. When Hamilton returned to headquarters, Washington was, of course, very happy to see him. So after this happy reunion, Hamilton warned Washington that he thinks Lee may have been captured. So Washington joyfully handed Lee's letter to Hamilton and they had a good laugh together. So in September 1777, the British were about to take Philadelphia. Washington decides to send Hamilton into Philadelphia to procure blankets, clothes, horses, shoes, military stores, boats, etc. Washington warned Hamilton that, and I quote, or failure, would involve the ruin of the army and perhaps the ruin of America. Hamilton was thus given confiscatory powers limited by his own judgment. Washington even had Hamilton write his own instructions. John Marshall later explained that Hamilton executed his duty with so much vigilance that very little public property fell with the city into the hands of the British general. Nevertheless, all the efforts of this very active officer could not obtain a supply in any degree adequate to the pressing and increasing wants of the army. Four times, Alexander Hamilton was appointed, either alone or with others, to negotiate general prisoner exchanges. The first time, the Americans and British got along great. There was a lot of drinking involved, in which Hamilton could not compete. At the end of this first meeting, 
Colonel O'Hara said, now if I am ever taken prisoner, I shall call on Colonel Hamilton, Colonel Harrison, Colonel Boudinot, etc., and I expect you'll immediately come to my aid and take care of me. So that's Charles O'Hara. He's later second in command at Yorktown. So at Yorktown, when the Americans won, the British General Cornwallis feigned the illness, and the story continues. Colonel O'Hara, the second in command, delivered up his sword on the parade to General Lincoln. So he came up. Now, sir, said he, perform your promise. Though when you made it, I little thought that I should ever have an opportunity of requiring your performance of it. Colonel Hamilton accordingly took care of him. Another time, negotiating by himself, Hamilton and the British commissary of prisoners agreed to an exchange, but the British commander-in-chief revoked it. Another set of negotiations, Hamilton wrote to his wife, our interview is attended with a great deal of sociability and good humor, but I begin notwithstanding to be tired of our British friends. One of, the principal, one of their principal excellencies consists in swallowing a large quantity of wine every day, and in this I am so unfortunate that I shall make no sort of figure with them. But there never was a general prisoner exchange because the British refused to acknowledge American sovereignty and the Continental Congress did not want to trade professional British soldiers for amateur American soldiers who had just returned to their farms. But Hamilton continued to work for individual exchanges of prisoners, some of which actually took place. Hamilton also was an acting diplomat to the French Army and Navy. According to the Baron von Steuben, Hamilton could speak French and English so well as to be understood in both better than anyone else in the Army. Hamilton was fluent in French. Washington barely knew any. As a result, Hamilton translated when Washington met with French officers. Hamilton translated incoming letters from, what, from the French Army and Naval officers. Hamilton wrote some of Washington's most important letters to French officers. Hamilton, when he was aide, wrote most of Washington's letters to the French commander-in-chief. Hamilton was sent frequently to the French Army and Navy to coordinate operations. The French admiral later wrote about Hamilton. His talents and his personal qualities have secured him forever my esteem, my confidence, and my friendship. The French major general, the Marquis de Chastelux, wrote that Hamilton's correspondence with the French, which language he speaks and writes perfectly well, justified the confidence with which he was honored. When Hamilton resigned from Washington's staff, Philip Schuyler, his father-in-law, tried to convince him to stay. And his main argument was, I fear the effect, especially with the French officers, with the French minister, and even with the French court. They know and acknowledge your abilities and how necessary you are to the general. Because of Hamilton's recognized abilities and popularity among the French, Hamilton was also mentioned a number of times as a possible minister to France. But his good friend, John Lawrence, the son of the president of Congress, was sent instead. Lawrence, who thought that Hamilton would have been a better choice, noted that Hamilton was not sufficiently known. So also, the Baron von Steuben did not know English. He was German, but he knew French. So Hamilton translated for Steuben, wrote letters for him, and advised him. Hamilton and Lafayette became great friends. Lafayette vouched for Hamilton with his French compatriots. Elizabeth Hamilton later noted, the Marquis loved Mr. Hamilton as a brother. Their love was mutual. Hamilton also served as a spy master. Hamilton helped Washington manage his espionage network. He knew the identity of many of Washington's spies. He wrote to those spies, and, or to their handlers. He received intelligence and acted upon it, even in Washington's absence. He also helped Washington spread misinformation, counterintelligence to the British. So we'll give a couple of concrete examples. So one time, Hamilton himself received a letter from Elisha Boudinot. It was written to him, not to Washington. That's the brother of the more famous Elias Boudinot. So Elisha Boudinot warns him that the British were headed to Rhode Island. Hamilton shared this info with Washington and then wrote for Washington to John Sullivan in Rhode Island. Sullivan retreated in consideration of the intelligence and saved his army from almost certain defeat. Another time, Washington was absent when a letter arrived for him. Hamilton, as his aide, opened Washington's letter. It was important intelligence that the British, again, were sailing to Rhode Island. Without Washington being present, Hamilton immediately acted, forwarding the information to the army in Rhode Island. Washington returned 
moved its troops for an attack on New York City. Seeing this, the British returned to New York and the army in Rhode Island was safe. Hamilton had his own contacts in New York and New Jersey, where he had lived before the war. Men whose names might be familiar, like Elijah Boudinot and the now more famous Hercules Mulligan, who Hamilton might have recruited. Hamilton might have also been involved in recruiting and communicating with James Rivington. So James Rivington acted as the King's printer in New York City, but he was secretly providing intelligence to Washington. Now you may remember James Rivington as the publisher of Hamilton's full vindication and the farmer refuted, and the man attacked by one of those mobs that Hamilton opposed. During the war, Hamilton wrote at least two more sets of essays. One was against a corrupt politician. He, had, he used the pseudonym Publius, which was the pseudonym he used for the Federalist Papers. Another was a six-part Continentalist, in which he argued for a stronger union and an enlargement of the powers of the federal government. Now, Hamilton also wrote lengthy letters to men like Robert Morris and James Duane, arguing for a stronger union, enlargement of the powers of government, and also for an improved financial system, including a national bank. So this writing about the bank and financial system to Morris and Duane shows that Hamilton knew his economic theory and also how to put it into practice. It also shows that others knew that Hamilton knew this. Hamilton had also written numerous letters for Washington displaying advanced financial understanding. At one point, Congressman John Sullivan asked Washington about Hamilton as a potential superintendent of finance. Sullivan wrote, I wish your excellency would be so obliging as to give me your opinion with respect to Colonel Hamilton as a financier. Washington, perhaps because he didn't want to lose his aide, Hamilton, did not endorse him for the job, but he still praised them highly. There are few men to be found of his age who have a more general knowledge than he possesses, and none whose soul is more firmly engaged in the cause or who exceeds him in probity and sterling virtue. So instead of Hamilton, Robert Morris got the job. In fact, Hamilton had endorsed Morris for the position. So after that, Hamilton not getting the job, Sullivan asked, suggested that Hamilton would be the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, but Hamilton, not being sufficiently known, didn't get that job either. After leaving Washington's staff, Hamilton was appointed to command a battalion of light artillery. So he marched his men along with the rest of the army from the Hudson River to the Chesapeake, from there to, took a ship to Williamsburg, and then marched a short, short distance to Yorktown. At Yorktown, they took their turn constructing earthworks and serving as a covering party. When one new trench was opened, Hamilton ordered his battalion to mount the bank, front the enemy, and there, by word of command, go through all the ceremony of soldiery. Although the enemy had been firing a little before, they did not now give us a single shot. In the end, there were just two redoubts left to take before the British could be defeated. Hamilton was given command of taking redoubt 10. He led the troops up over the parapet and into the redoubt. In less than 10 minutes, and with few casualties, the redoubt was taken. This won Hamilton the military distinction he had been seeking and ended his service in the army. But the war was not over. Hamilton went to his wife and her family in Albany. There, he was studying the art of fleecing my neighbors. In other words, he was becoming a lawyer. Robert Morris, the superintendent of finance, asked Hamilton to be the receiver of continental taxes for New York. Hamilton hesitated, but eventually he agreed. He didn't collect much because the state refused to pay its share. But failing at this, Hamilton convinced the New York legislature to adopt resolutions to increase the taxing power of Congress and revise the Articles of Confederation. The New York legislators decided to send Hamilton to Congress. Hamilton was now, whether he wanted to be or not, a politician. In Congress, Hamilton met and formed an alliance with James Madison. Together, they introduced a tax to be collected by Congress rather than the states. Of course, it was voted down. Hamilton's most important and well-known act was to warn Washington that a, that a mutiny was underway. Washington was not aware of this, or at least he was not aware of how deep the conspiracy went. And thanks to Hamilton's warning, he was able to stop the Newburgh conspiracy. Now, in April 1773, the war officially ended and the army was disbanded. Hamilton continued his work, and for two more decades, 
fought for this country. But that's the story for another day. So we thus see Hamilton's contributions in many diverse areas throughout the American Revolution, including as an essayist, public speaker, defender of loyalists, militiamen, artillery captain, military secretary, military and political correspondent, military advisor, acting commander in chief, field commander, scout, quartermaster, prisoner exchange negotiator, diplomat to the French army and navy, spy master, financier, battalion commander, tax collector, congressman and politician. I argue that no one contributed as much as Hamilton during the war in so many different areas. The diversity of his experience laid the groundwork for his much greater accomplishments later regarding the Constitution and the administration of government. <laughs>